from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon. My name is William Jacobs, and I'm the chief of the Interpretive Programs Office. The Interpretive Programs Office, or IPO, is responsible for the development of new exhibitions and related educational programs at the Library of Congress. Today's event, co-sponsored by IPO and the Law Library of Congress, is presented in conjunction with the Library of Congress exhibition, The Civil Rights Act of 1964, A Long Struggle for Freedom. This important exhibition commemorates the 50th anniversary of the landmark Civil Rights Act of 1964. It looks at events that shaped the civil rights movement and explores the far-reaching impact of the act on a changing society. Located in the historic, historic Thomas Jefferson Building across the street, the exhibition has attracted more than 355,000 visitors since it opened to the public last fall on September 10th. In addition, educational programming related to the exhibition held to date includes more than 135 exhibition tours for groups of all types, nine gallery talks by library specialists featuring items on display in the exhibition, a February 2015 public film series featuring four full-length television documentaries from the civil rights era in celebration of Black History Month, a public book talk and signing by author Clay Risen, uh, on his book, The Bill of the Century, The Epic Battle for the Civil Rights Act, two on-site workshops and three online webinars for K-12 teachers focused on teaching about civil rights with original and digitized primary sources from the exhibition. The exhibition, funded by a generous grant from Newman's own foundation and with additional support from history, has been extended through January 2nd, uh, 2016. Please check the library's website for visiting hours and continuously updated information about upcoming educational programs related to the exhibition. At this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce our speaker, Patricia A. Sullivan. Patricia Sullivan is a professor of history at the University of South Carolina and director of a series of summer institutes at Harvard University's WEB Du Bois Institute on Teaching the History of the Civil Rights Movement. Her publications include Lift Every Voice, the NAACP and the Making of the Civil Rights Movement, published in 2009, Freedom Writer, Virginia Foster Durr, Letters from the Civil Rights Years, printed in 2003, and Days of Hope, Race and Democracy in the New Deal Era, published in 1996. She is co-editor of the John Hope Franklin series in African American History and Culture at the University of North Carolina Press. Professor Sullivan also served as one of the scholarly advisors during the conceptual planning of the Civil Rights Act exhibition. She will now share her thoughts on her current project, a book on Robert F. Kennedy, Civil Rights and the Struggle for Racial Justice in the 1960s. Patricia. Thank you uh, very much um, for that introduction and uh, to all of the folks in the Interpretive uh, Programs Office uh, who created this remarkable exhibit that working on it was such a pleasure and I learned so much and uh, it's wonderful that it will be here through December. Uh, so I hope if you haven't seen it that you will go and, and see it. It's really, really terrific. Um, thank you all for coming and thank my friends uh, for coming. Uh, uh, today. It's, um, the Civil Rights Act uh, stands as a living monument to the Civil Rights Movement, and that's a, so beautifully uh, demonstrated in this exhibit. Uh, the exhibit captures the broad sweep and dynamic history that culminated with the Civil Rights Act in 1964, legislation that changed America in fundamental ways, ending the racial caste system in the South, and expanding federal protection of citizenship rights that continues to shape our lives and create uh, new opportunities. The exhibit also documents a history that is closely intertwined with America's long struggle with race. Uh, it includes a large flag proclaiming a man was lynched today that would hang outside of the NASP's office on Fifth Avenue documenting uh, whenever a lynching happened during the 1920s and 1930s. 
Uh, and this, it's really to see it. I was with Julian Baum when we saw it in the exhibit, and we both just froze to see it. It's gigantic, hung way up. Uh, and it's a sobering reminder of the depths of racial brutality and national indifference that has marked our history. Uh, recent incidents of police violence and killings shine a light on the persistent legacies and manifestations of America's ongoing racial dilemma. So uh, I welcome this opportunity to talk, to talk with you today about Robert Kennedy and um, his history in relationship to the Civil Rights Act and the movement that it grew from. Grew from. A circumstance has placed Robert Kennedy in a unique position to respond to the challenges and opportunities uh, created by the civil rights movement at its most pivotal moment. First, some background, since I've been digging in the archives to get a chance to talk about your project is dangerous, you know, because you're there. But, but I think it's interesting to note what, what I've been struck by, uh, the combination of individual characteristics and experiences, experiences that help explain Robert Kennedy's development as a rare leader in America's long struggle for racial justice. He had the self-assuredness and sense of entitlement common to a son of privilege. He was fiercely ambitious, though not for personal, personal recognition or advancement, and had a finely tuned sense of right and wrong. Labeled a misfit by his high school classmates, he did not hesitate to go against the grain of established practices. He was compassionate and demonstrated an ability to attract and cultivate people who shared his dedication to public service like Peter Edelman, who joins us today. Most significantly, I think, is what colleagues and friends called his experiencing nature. As one associate recalled, he went, he saw, he listened, he grew. Born in 1925, Robert Kennedy came of age at a time when segregation was becoming more deeply entrenched throughout the country, even as the NACP mounted the protracted challenge to segregation in the South that culminated with the 1954 Brown ruling. The 1950s, the decade that Kennedy began his professional life, marked the largest migration of African Americans from the South to the North and West, the culmination of the Great Migration, which dramatically altered uh, the racial uh, landscape of this country. By 1960, an estimated 48% of black Americans lived in the North, trapped in overcrowded housing, substandard schools, minimal access to jobs, and aggressive policing. Prior to 1960, the year his brother ran for president, uh, Kennedy said he never thought much about race. He grew up learning that there were people less fortunate who had a difficult time, both black and white, and that you had a social responsibility for doing something about it. Yet an early confrontation with the color line is revealing. In 1951, during his third year in law school at the University of Virginia, Kennedy invited Ralph Bunch to speak at the university as a guest of the Student Legal Forum. Bunch had just been awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his role in the settlement of the first Arab-Israeli war, and Kennedy had traveled uh, to the war-torn area in 1948 on the eve of Israel's establishment. So that's, I think, what attracted him to Bunch. Bunch accepted with one condition. He would not address a segregated audience. Segregation of public gatherings was the law in Virginia at that time. There was tremendous opposition on campus to such an arrangement, Kennedy later recalled, and students on the legal forum were divided about what to do. Determined that Bunch would visit and believing that the policy was wrong, Kennedy wrote a letter appealing directly to the president of the university, Colgate Darden, and I'm quoting for that, from that. The segregation policy in this instance, he wrote, is legally indefensible and morally wrong. He cited the recent Supreme Court decision, McLaurin versus Oklahoma, a 1950 ruling which barred racial segregation of students within the university. Kennedy advised, where the University of Virginia offers a public lecture open to citizens of the state, it cannot require colored citizens in attending these addresses uh, to be seated in segregated areas. In his letter, Kennedy explained that the audience for the forum events ranged from 300 to 400 people, and that it wasn't likely that more than 30 or 40 blacks would attend. Darden agreed to a temporary suspension of the policy. On Easter Monday, Kennedy introduced Bunch to an overflow crowd of more than 1,500 people in Cabell Hall on the grounds of the university. An estimated 500 of them were black. This was the first public integrated meeting of its kind on the grounds of the University of Virginia. 
Uh, also, there was no hotel accommodations for Ralph Bunch in Charlottesville, so he stayed with Bobby and his new wife, Ethel, and it was the beginning of a long friendship. It was not until 1960 that the issue of race moved to the center of Kennedy's attention, the year that Kennedy directed his brother's campaign for the presidency. That year, as you know, the sit-ins ignited student protests and expanding activism across the South, protests that would soon turn national attention to conditions in the region. However, for presidential candidates John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon, the black vote in electoral-rich northern and western states, vastly increased by the migration of the 50s, was of primary concern and offering the movement uh, some critical leverage. As he navigated the fault lines dividing southern Democrats and northern black voters, 34-year-old Robert Kennedy was exposed to social and political realities that had, beyond, had been beyond his vision and concern. I just want to take a brief look at several episodes during the 1960 campaign that reveal a sensibility beyond political calculation, which was important. I forgot to show you a picture. I'm not paying attention to my notes. But there he is with uh, Ralph Bunch at the university. And I like this picture of him campaigning. He was a hard worker, so this is probably out of character. But anyway, there he is. Um, uh, so the Kennedy campaign created the first civil rights division affiliated with a major party with an integrated staff that included uh, Marjorie Lawson, an attorney and uh, columnist for the Pittsburgh Courier and wife of the civil rights attorney Belford Lawson, Harris Wofford, a young constitutional law professor who had a personal acquaintance with Martin Luther King and was the first white person to attend Howard Law School, and Lewis Martin, who had been a leading labor organizer, an ACP activist, and newspaper publisher in Detroit. During the 1960 uh, Democratic Convention, Robert Kennedy approved a civil rights plank that went far beyond anything offered previously. It reads, it's three pages long, and reads like a blueprint for the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Harris, Wofford, and Chester Bowles had drafted the far-reaching document, assuming it would be rejected by Kennedy. A more modest version was ready to go. They were surprised and delighted when Kennedy endorsed the plank leading Strom Thurmond to charge that it was, quote, the most extreme, unconstitutional, and anti-Southern platform ever conceived by a major political party. Even the NACP has never proposed more drastic steps. So there are several interesting examples um, that show Robert Kennedy pressing at the edges and his brother working to placate Southern Democrats. Uh, I want to mention one in particular and then a, one, a more familiar one. But, but one that I really think is, is fascinating is uh, an account uh, by George Peek, who was worked on the Southern campaign for JFK. He was, he was an aide to George Smather. And he recalls a trip with uh, Robert Kennedy through Georgia to Savannah. This is Peek. The advanced man had a route to the hotel. Bobby said, is it through the black part of town? We said, no. He said, well, I want to go through the black part of town. So we did. We changed the trip into Savannah. Then when we got there, the first thing he asked me was, find out how many blacks we're going to have here tonight. Well, I knew we weren't going to have any, because that hotel would not have blacks in those days. I went back to him and said we weren't. He said, well, we're not going to have dinner unless you get some blacks here, OK? So he went about inviting some blacks that evening. He was very difficult to work with, very difficult. Shortly after that incident, and this is more well known, this is really the only thing people talk about in relationship to the 1960 campaign, and it's very significant. Martin Luther King was arrested and jailed following a sit-in demonstration in Atlanta just weeks before the election. King, uh, yet to be the major national figure he would become, was sent to a prison, a prison in rural Reedsville, Georgia, and there was great concern for his safety. At the urging of Harris Wofford, a John F. Kennedy phoned uh, Coretta Scott King to express his concern. Independently, Robert Kennedy called the judge who had denied King his constitutional right to bail and apparently chewed him out. Uh, RFK's call secured King's release. On the Sunday before the election, and Harris Warford tells a great story about putting these flyers on Greyhound buses and shipping them all over so they could be distributed at black churches on Sunday, describing what the Kennedys had done. Uh, for uh, Martin Luther King. Uh, many blacks, including Martin Luther King Sr., uh, voted for John F. Kennedy as a result. And it is likely, and Jonathan Alter thinks this is true, 
uh, that the black vote provided the margin of victory for John F. Kennedy in the closest presidential election uh, in American history up to that point. Now, this story would end there if Robert Kennedy had not yielded to the pressure put on him by his father and brother and accepted a position in his brother's cabinet as attorney general. Uh, this had major consequences for the history of this era and the circumstances surrounding the Civil Rights Act. The transformation of the Justice Department in relationship to the Civil Rights Movement began on the day that Robert Kennedy met John Doerr, a lanky Midwestern uh, lawyer and Republican holdover uh, who had joined the fledgling Civil Rights Division the previous July. Uh, no one else would take the job. He was the third person they asked. It was the end of the Eisenhower administration. The division had been established by the 1957 uh, Civil Rights Act, a watered-down bill conceived to remedy voting rights abuses in the South, uh, but it did give the Justice Department some jurisdiction in voting rights cases. Doerr and the small group of lawyers in the division worked to develop a government strategy capable of effectively um, prosecuting violations of voting rights. Reliance on FBI reports were a problem. They didn't include any facts, Doerr complained. Frustrated by a flimsy report on the mass eviction of blacks who had attempted to register to vote in Haywood County, Tennessee, Doerr, who had been a personal injury lawyer for 10 years, decided to go south and see for himself. Armed with a camera, he met with the evicted sharecroppers, documented their stories, took pictures, and filed a lawsuit in federal court uh, that September. This would mark an important turning point in the work of the Civil Rights Division. On January 19, 1960, the day before JFK was inaugurated, the Civil Rights Division filed a lawsuit regarding the case of Joseph Francis Atlas, a black farmer in East Carroll Parish, Louisiana. Dorgan had gone south to investigate this case and found that Atlas had testified um, before the Civil Rights Commission in New Orleans. He was, he was invited to testify about the fact that no blacks in East Carroll Parish voted. And after he was done, local ginners refused to gin his cotton. He had about 100 acres. Uh, uh, he and his wife had raised and educated eight children, and they faced financial ruin. Robert, this is Doris remembering. Robert Kennedy came to my office the second or third day after JFK was inaugurated uh, to find out what was going on in the division. Dora told him about the case of Joseph Francis Atlas. You picked a bad place to start, Kennedy said. Well, that's where Atlas grows his cotton, he said. And he explained how when Atlas returned from the hearings in New Orleans, the sheriff met him at his door. Uh, he told the farmer not to bring his cotton to any ginner in East Carroll Paris. Parish. When Atlas asked why, the sheriff responded, civil rights. For the next week or so, Dorr recalled, Kennedy worked to persuade the ginners of the parish to gin the cotton and finally secured an agreement. Dorr advised that this would not be su sufficient. Without a court injunction, the agreement would be ignored. Kennedy worked out an arrangement whereby all of the ginners would appear before Judge Dawkins in Monroe, Louisiana, and pledge not to deprive Atlas of the goods and services he needed to run his farm. And he sent Dorr to Monroe to appear before the judge and witness the agreement on the part of the ginners. Think of it, Dorr recalled, 50 years later, the attorney general from the first day put his mind and his effort and his energy and his drive just to help one cotton farmer in East Carroll Parish, Louisiana, gin his cotton. That was a good omen for this country. Dorr would play a major role in building and leading the Civil Rights Division, working under the assistance um, of the Attorney General for Civil Rights, the quiet and enormously talented Burke Marshall. On March 6th, Kennedy presided over a total review of the Justice Department's approach to civil rights. There would be no immediate legislation introduced given congressional and political realities. Energy, effort, and brains would be dedicated to pushing as far as they could under current civil rights legislation, using the persuasive and legal power of the administration to secure compliance with desegregation rulings and voter registration laws. Immediate attention was given to uh, getting the government to, in Kennedy's words, clean up its own act and hire black employees. Robert Kennedy wrote to all the major law schools asking the deans, quote, to furnish me with the names of qualified Negro attorneys of your acquaintance who might be interested in coming to the department. We're also interested in encouraging promising law students to consider making a career here. Voting was a top priority. 
doors, get out the roadmaps, and go. It was a very Kennedy approach, and it appealed to Robert Kennedy and would be central to the work that defined a vastly expanded civil rights division. Kennedy approved the hiring of more lawyers. I think he quadrupled the number of lawyers in the division. Um, and the division mounted what was, in effect, a field operation. Lawyers spent weeks at a time in the Deep South investigating court records and registration documents, interviewing blacks, and developing a relationship with SNCC and local civil rights activists. And this was Kennedy's idea. They put a map up in the office with colored pins indicating trouble spots and places where cases had been filed. Dorr recalled that RFK's mantra was, you're not doing enough. He wanted cases in every county in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Alabama. By 1963, the division had filed 34 suits against county registrars for discrimination in voter registration and had 48 other counties under investigation. It had filed 12 suits seeking injunctions against intimidation with another eight under investigation. It had examined voter registration records in 27 counties in Alabama, 50 counties in Mississippi, and 27 counties in Louisiana. Still, in the short term, accelerated efforts on voting rights, on the voting rights front, and escalating battles around racial segregation pressed at the limits of federal power and tested the capacity of the Kennedy administration to meet a mounting crisis in the South. The state-sanctioned violence that met the Freedom Riders in the spring of 1961 was Robert Kennedy's baptism. Uh, he soon found out that the FBI had failed to disclose information that they had on plans by the Klan with the cooperation of local police to assault the Riders in Alabama. During a mass meeting at the First Baptist Church in Montgomery honoring the riders, a mob of several thousand surrounded the church, trapped over a thousand people inside, and threatened to burn it down. Robert Kennedy spent a tense late night on the phone with Martin Luther King, who was inside the church, while his appeals to Alabama Governor James Patterson, who had been a big supporter of John F. Kennedy's, were ignored. At the very last minute, federal marshals dispersed the mob, people with no experience in mob control, uh, barely averting an unspeakable human disaster. As a result of the Freedom Rides, Kennedy's, uh, Kennedy mandated that the ICC enforce the Supreme Court ruling banning segregation on interstate commerce, um, interstate travel, a minor victory in an ongoing battle. Uh, and I just read recently that Kennedy's never spoke to John, uh, John Patterson again. <laughs> Efforts to implement school desegregation in the South was a further test. Uh, Kennedy's first speech, uh, public speech, was at the University of Georgia, uh, where two black students, Charlene Hunter Galt and Hamilton Holmes, had integrated uh, the university that January. And he said, uh, probably the first federal official on Southern ground, that Brown was the law and the administration would enforce civil rights laws. Uh, he spent his first months in office working. Uh, with Louisiana officials uh, successfully to avoid a school shutdown uh, in the face of school se uh, desegregation in that state. Uh, and the Justice Department filed a suit against Prince Edward County, which had closed their schools rather than desegregate and transferred the public monies to support private schools for white children, leaving no schools for the black children in that community uh, since 1959. Um, and Burke Marshall and John Siegenthal would go around and meet with these various communities and try to persuade them to comply and, if not, bring, bring legal pressure. The limits of the administration's approach were amplified in a number of ways, but especially in Mississippi in October of 1962, where the actions of a defiant Governor Ross Barnett incited violence resistance to the admission of James Meredith, leaving two people dead and compelling the Kennedy administration to send federal troops to restore order and secure Meredith's admission. So by early 1963, it all seemed like patchwork at best, as, ra as the racial conflict in the South escalated towards a breaking point. Now, during the same period, Robert Kennedy's concern about poverty and, uh, and racial segregation that he apparently had witnessed during his, the presidential campaign deepened. After a CBS interview in Midtown Manhattan early in 61, he walked up to Harlem, where he talked with young people and observed physical conditions of poor, segregated urban neighborhood. As Peter Edelman said to me once, Bobby loved to walk. And I love that, that example. Um, in a speech given shortly after that to the National Committee for Children and Youth 
Conference of Unemployed Out-of-School Youth in Urban Areas that May, he commented on the interrate-related inter problems of school dropout rates, youth unemployment, and rising prison rates for young people under 22, and emphasized the importance of dealing with the sources of delinquency as opposed to the end results. That spring, Kennedy enlisted his friend David Hackett to coordinate a program to study the cases, the causes of juvenile delinquency, and develop programs to aid youth. Uh, this resulted in the establishment of the President's Commission on Juvenile Delinquency, an interagency program housed in the Justice Department. Hackett drew in the expertise of uh, social scientists like Richard Cloward and Lloyd Olin and the work of Kenneth Clark in Harlem in fashioning a program that funded locally initiated pilot projects. The projects aim to mobilize the resources of a particular city to address um, the problems of youth, problems that they concluded were structural and historical, rooted in lack of access to decent education and health care, rampant unemployment, poor recreational facilities, racial discrimination, and long-term poverty. During 1961 and 62, Robert Kennedy visited each one of these pilot projects, and there were an estimated 16. I'm still trying to identify where they all were. Hackett recalled that neither he nor Kennedy had ever been involved up close with poverty or with Negroes prior to this, and they were shocked as they began to see what the conditions were like around the country. Urban poverty became the focus of Hackett's group, and the concept of community action and empowering the poor became central to the anti-poverty program that was in development in the developmental stage when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. By the end of 1962, then, Robert Kennedy began speaking about racial segregation and discrimination as a national, not a regional problem. In March of 63, addressing the gathering um, the a commemoration of the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation in Kentucky, he told the gathering that the problems created by racial discrimination were massive. He continued, the results of racial discrimination carry on for generation after generation. To face this openly and try to meet it squarely is the challenge of this decade. Uh, Martin Luther King had begun his campaign in Birmingham, and uh, within weeks that city was edging towards what seemed like a race war. Uh, during the first week of May, images of the city's police assaulting hundreds of protesting black youth with dogs and high-pressure fire hoses blanketed the nation and were beamed across the world, uh, thrusting America's racial conflict to the forefront of public awareness. Uh, police violence, mob terror, and the bombing of the hotel housing Martin Luther King Jr. brought thousands of blacks into the streets of Birmingham and ignited pent-up despair and anger in Americans' urban areas across the country. A wave of mass demonstrations amplified the prophetic warning in James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time, which had been published several months earlier. Birmingham brought urgent efforts uh, to push beyond normal channels and find the nation's capacity to resolve a problem woven deep into American life. On May 17th, uh, Robert Kennedy and Burke Marshall outlined plans for a civil rights bill and the Justice Department lawyers began drafting legislation. Kennedy initiated and attended endless rounds of meetings in Washington and New York. Um, at the same time, he lobbied national business leaders to voluntarily end segregation in their southern Bay stores, movie theaters, and other public facilities. There were small private meetings with national civic, business, philanthropic, and political leaders to build support for major civil rights legislation. On May 24th, uh, in a highly unusual meeting, he met with a small group of black activists and artists convene, convened by James Baldwin, hoping to seek their advice on what could be done to counter the appeal of Malcolm X and other militant groups. And you know, you get a sense when you're in this period that things are on edge. Um, the gathering, and I, I've spent a lot of time on this, but just a little bit, but it quickly dissolved into an attack on the failure of the Kennedy administration uh, to do more uh, and to effectively address the depths of the racial crisis throughout the country, racial discrimination. At several points, he tried to intervene and shift the conversation, and um, it, it didn't work. Uh, so he retreated into silence. Um, by all accounts, the meeting, uh, and, and it went on, and they just unloaded on him about everything. Um, by all accounts, uh, the meeting was a remarkable display and we don't pay enough attention to this, of the divide in experience and understanding for someone even as in, well, you know, interested and concerned as Robert Kennedy and his black contemporaries. Kenneth Clark said, we might as well have been speaking different languages. 
But he added, the fact that Bobby, Kennedy, Bobby sat there through, the, through such an ordeal for three hours in his house, his apartment, uh, Clark commented, proved that he was among, he was among, and this is something Lorraine Hansberry said to him, if you don't get it, we're in big trouble, because you are among the best white America has to offer. A week later, Robert Kennedy was with, was with the president when John F. Kennedy decided that he would go ahead and introduce comprehensive civil rights legislation. A tough decision that Kennedy acknowledged, John F. Kennedy acknowledged was morally right and essential to meeting this crisis, but he told his brother that it would probably be his political swan song. There's a real concern that it would cost him his, the election and all of his aides thought that and they told him not to do it. Um, but he wanted to wait until after the desegregation of the University of Alabama on June 11th before acting on this decision. That afternoon, following the peaceful integration of the university, he decided to go on television at 7 o'clock and announce plans to introduce the Civil Rights Bill. Uh, so as much frantic activity for several hours as he worked with his brother and speechwriter Ted Sorensen sketching out what he would say. President Kennedy's June 11th speech um, Parts of it written down, most of it spoken extemporaneously, reflected the strong influence of his brother. There were echoes of Robert Kennedy's South Carolina speech, and interestingly, Kenneth Clark was stunned and somewhat reassured to hear phrases and concerns that they had expressed during their meeting with Robert Kennedy woven through the president's speech. It's, a tr it's an amazing, wonderful, extraordinary speech which everyone should read. The president described the human toll of America's racial past and the lost futures of children who were attending segregated, segregated schools nearly a decade after the Brown ruling. He spoke with deep conviction about the urgency of the moment. Quote, the, qu the fires of frustration and discord are burning in every city, north and south. And he insisted that there was a moral imperative to act. This is a problem that faces us all not merely as presidents, congressmen, or governors, but every citizen of the United States. And again, just to highlight this period, just hours after he gave the speech, Medgar Evers uh, was gunned down in his driveway and killed in Jackson, Mississippi. Uh, on June 26, 1963, uh, H.R. 7152 was introduced in the House of Representatives and as head of the sponsoring department, Robert Kennedy was the first to testify. Uh, Burke Marshall recalled, told Victor Navasky, when President Kennedy sent up that civil rights bill, every single person who spoke about it in the White House, every one of them was against President Kennedy sending up that bill, against his speech in June, against making it a moral issue. The conclusive voice within the government at that time, there is no question about it at all, that Robert Kennedy was the one. He urged it, he felt it, he understood it, and he prevailed. I don't think there was anyone in the cabinet except the president himself who felt that way on these issues, and the president got it from his brother. Now someone told me that in the exhibit, there's a film showing Kennedy being, deciding whether to make this speech or not, and the look on his face and his brother working with him to bring him to agree to do that. So it's right down that exhibit. You can see, see how this plays out. Um, so work towards building a bipartisan coalition for the bill begins, and the books by uh, the Whalens is a terrific book on the, on the bill, and, and Risen and Todd Purdom kind of get into the nitty gritty of that. A lot of it happens while under the Kennedy watch. They get McCullough lined up immediately, and then just the tough work of, of, of patching that together. But it's, again, important to remember, as the bill moves forward, uh, we have the March on Washington, which captivates the, uh, the nation. Uh, and King's uh, I Have a Dream speech. And then on September 15th, uh, I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, technically challenged here. We'll move forward. That's a 63, a rally that spring, but I want to put that up there. Uh, the uh, Klansman bomb, it was right after school desegregation finally began in, in Alabama. George Wallace tried to oppose it, he couldn't stop it. The schools are being desegregated and Klansmen bomb the 16th Street Baptist Church that September, killing uh, four girls age 11 to 14. The day after the bombing of the church, the Prince Edward 
County Free School opened in Farmville, fulfilling Robert Kennedy's efforts. For the first time in four years, 1,500 black children in Prince Edward County were able to attend school. Of course, as we know, uh, President Kennedy was assassinated that November 22nd. Lyndon Johnson made passage of the Civil Rights Bill, John F. Kennedy's Civil Rights Bill, his first priority. No memorial oration or eulogy could more eloquently honor President Kennedy's memory than the earliest passage of the Civil Rights Bill for which he fought for so long. He failed to add with the steadfast help and uh, work of his brother. Uh, the political master worked in tandem with a remarkable array of forces, most significantly the team that Kennedy had built in the Civil Rights Division. I read an interview by Frank Vallejo, who was Secretary of the Senate then, and he said, Burke Marshall and Nicholas Katzenbach, I mean, they knew the bill inside out, they lobbied very effectively, they were as important, if not more important, than Lyndon Johnson. Now, I don't think we need to assign credit, but it's important to think of this foundation. You know, I've heard it said that they wouldn't have, it wouldn't have passed without Lyndon Johnson. Well, there wouldn't have been a bill uh, without the Kennedys. And I think the work of the Civil Rights Division that Robert Kennedy built is enormously important and, 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 and overlooked to a great, to a great extent. Uh, and of course, this remarkable coalition that comes together uh, and helps to, um, to see this bill uh, pass a filibuster. Um, the bill passed on, uh, passed the Senate just about a year to the day of its introduction the previous June, and on July 2nd, Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, um, one of the most important and transformative laws in the history of the United States. Uh, two weeks later, a police shooting of James Powell, a 15-year-old black uh, teenager uh, in New York City, ignited race riots in Harlem and Bedford-Stuyvesant signaling a turn that revealed the fragility of the coalition that had grown up during the 1960s and previewed a new, even more challenging phase of America's long struggle with race. Shortly before he left the department to run for Senate in August of 1964, Robert Kennedy met with Lyndon Johnson and then he followed it up with a memo urging the president to convene a conference of mayors and begin to systematically address America's cities, housing, education, poverty, criminal justice issues. Elected to the Senate from New York that fall, Robert Kennedy emerged as a political leader in his own right during a transitional time for the country and for Kennedy in the aftermath of his brother's assassination. Uh, Jack Newfield has commented or commented in his book, experience began to stretch Bobby Kennedy, tragedy transformed him. In ways similar to Martin Luther King, Kennedy began to concentrate attention on the deep-rooted racial and economic inequities and injustices that had been exposed by the civil rights movement and did not lend themselves to easy or to clear solutions. And, he, and they both worked to cultivate uh, and expand upon the promise of the civil rights years. Uh, this is Kennedy speaking. We have gone as far as goodwill and even good legislation will take us. We must now act to bring about changes in the conditions which breed intolerance and discrimination. He commented late in the spring of 1965. Uh, in August 65, uh, riots in the Watts section of Los Angeles just five days after Lyndon Johnson signed the Voting Rights Act marked the most deadly and destructive riots in American history, uh, once again ignited by long-term problems of police violence and abuses. Um, five days of rioting claimed 34 lives and $40 million in property damage. Kennedy and his aide, Peter Edelman, uh, went, traveled to Los Angeles, where they confronted, and I think I've got this little phrase right, what Peter Edelman described as the war zone here in our own country. Former President Eisenhower echoed a growing refrain claiming that the problem facing American cities was the need for greater respect for the law. I'll go back to there, sorry. Uh, Kennedy countered, there is no point in telling Negroes to obey the law. To many Negroes, the law is the enemy. In Harlem, Bedford-Stuyvesant, it has almost always been used against them. In the aftermath of Watts, King turns his attention to Chicago with his campaign to end slums, and Robert Kennedy initiated plans for what would become the Bedford-Stuyvesant Restoration Project, a bold, a bold public-private partnership which there's much written about, and it's fascinating, a re remarkable uh, effort. 
um, the first community development corporation in the country. It was organized around a systematic attack on ghetto conditions. Programs focused on job training and creation, housing restoration and construction, health and recreation, schooling, economic development. Kennedy said early on, uh, typical you know, problems and factions, and because the community was directly, you know, had full partnership in this with, and they were funders and people they raised money from, government money, philanthropists. So Kennedy said early on, I'm not sure it's going to work, uh, but it's going to test some new ideas, some new ways of doing things. Even if we fail, we'll have learned. But more important than that, something must be done. People like myself can't go around making nice speeches all the time. We've got, we have to do some damn hard work too. Problems of race and poverty and a faith in the capacity of Americans to act collectively to begin to remedy these injustices, injustices were at the center of Robert Kennedy's public life as a senator and his uh, presidential candidacy. He traveled to cities around the country. He exposed himself to the depths of rural poverty in the Deep South. Here he is with Marion Wright Edelman in Mississippi, where he traveled in 67, and horrified by the poverty he saw there, and to the conditions and struggles against apartheid in South Africa. In one of his last speeches, given the day after Martin Luther King was, was killed, and that's the night King was killed, he gave an amazing speech off the back of a truck, uh, which everyone should read. And the next morning, he gave one more speech, the last until King was, uh, the, the, until a funeral. But he wanted to talk about what he called the mindless menace of violence. And just a phrase from that remarkable speech, he spoke about the kind of violence that was slower, but just as deadly destructive as the shot or the bomb in the night. This is the violence of institutions, indifference, and inaction, and slow decay. This is the violence that affects the poor and poisons relations between men because their skin has different colors. This is the slow destruction of a child by hunger and schools without books and homes without heat in the winter. The question is whether we can find in our midst and our hearts that leadership of humane purpose that will recognize the terrible truths of our existence. But I wanna end on another note that uh, was equally part of his approach and feeling about the moment he was living and working in. Uh, words to the young anti-apartheid activists he visited in South Africa in June of 1966, which really, I think, captured the spirit of the civil rights legacy, movement's legacy, as well as um, Robert Kennedy's. The road toward equality and freedom is not easy, and great cost and danger march alongside us. Still, even in the turbulence of protest and struggle, there is greater hope for the future as men learn to claim and achieve for themselves the rights formally petitioned by others. Thank you. So questions? Questions? Comments? Yes. There was, there, were, there was action all throughout the South, but they had a constant, he wanted you know, cases in every county in those three deep South states. I guess they were considered the, uh, you know, the most resistant and toughest. And of course, Mississippi had a major project going on with SNCC. So it wasn't that they weren't in other counties, but there was a, a concentrated effort given their you know, resources and, and, and lawyer power. But I haven't read a specific explanation of that, but I, I would assume that was it. And I'm sorry, I'll repeat the question. That was a question about why um, the Justice Department map, the pins were concentrated in three states and, and whether the Justice Department was active in other states in the South. Yes. You know, 
I think personally, I mean, as we all get older, we know there are people we don't get on with, there are conflicts and tensions. I think too much attention in terms of the relationship between John F. Kennedy and Lyndon Johnson, I think we get too caught up in that. I think that, you know, one thing that really strikes me, after knowing this history more, how cold Lyndon Johnson was to him when he signed the Civil Rights Act. Robert Kennedy made it possible for Lyndon Johnson to have that bill to sign. That is a fact of history, which, uh, and I think that, that's important. How they felt about each other, that's deeply psychological, personal, it did not inhibit this work, you know? And I think that's important too. But I think it's important for scholars to really look at. And, and the other thing is that, you know, as Robert Kennedy develops and evolves and opens up his um, concerns to the uh, nature of racial inequality and, and the deep problem this country had, uh, historically grounded and structure, structural. Um, Lyndon Johnson, his response to the urban violence, his response, you know, we had money going to the war in Vietnam, poverty funds shrinking. So very different paths that they both travel during this post-civil rights voting rights period. Uh, and Robert Kennedy's leadership uh, and growth during this era is, is very significant and, and important in terms of thinking about his role uh, in the 1960s around these, these struggles and issues. Peter. Yeah, could you talk a little bit more about uh, the, both President Kennedy and RFK relationship to the Civil Rights Movement uh, in terms of, of the finally handing out to the President of making the proposal for the 64 Act? The relationship of John F. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy to the Civil Rights Movement. Um, you know, it, it, that's, I hope to learn more about that as I go forward. I think it's better than we've been led to believe. Uh, and I also think historians have been too uh, quick to kind of take the perspective of the, of the activists on the ground, which is important, you know, what they're going through and what they're uh, experiencing, and not realizing the cons what was they were trying to do at the federal level and the kind of constraints that existed. Um, so, but I do know that Robert Moses now uh, talks about, this, John Doerr is his lawyer, and he talks about, you know, what it meant to have access. They had t clear access to, to the Civil Rights Division at all times. And I interviewed Felton Henderson, who was uh, the only African-American attorney hired to, well, the first, and this is something, to work in the field, on, on this field team. And he told me, he got to know, of course, King. He had to stay in the hotels where uh, a lot of the, the in, especially in Birmingham, the Gaston, that he felt that movement people knew the Kennedy uh, administration was responsive, and that helped to generate uh, the momentum of the movement. So I think that's a great question, and I hope that the work I'm doing will help open it up and sort of contextualize it a bit more than looking at this side, that side. Our country, I mean, the segregation, you know, the, the way people felt about this issue, how deeply entrenched it was, and this is a democracy, right? Uh, the, the political challenges were huge. And when they were debating that bill, uh, what was happening in the North around the World's Fair and all, at one point McCullough says, the deal is off if they protest at the, you know, block traffic to the World's Fair. So the context is very fragile, and I think what you see with in the Kennedy administration is this, especially the Civil Rights Division and Robert Kennedy, pushing, trying to find ways to go. But, um, but that relationship, I think, I hope I can take a closer look at and have something fresh to state. Thanks. So video clips, I mean, listen, we use a lot uh, because it's very reflective of that relationship, the Kennedy relationship, and Bobby was the only one that spoke up and said, you have to give it a speech. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a fly on the wall documentation. That's right. Of the re relationship. And then the subsequent clip of the speech itself, where Kennedy, they only show part of it, but contemporaneous, without a script, for four minutes in that speech on live TV in a convincing way. Oh, yeah. He without mentioning mm -hmm. the act at all. Mm -hmm. but focusing on the community and activity in the community and the need for racial justice. That is, it's a real key. For those that haven't seen that, with visitors, I always take them over to that, show them, 
that fly on the wall, why they were there with that camera at that time. You just don't see that insider view. You know, I think that I think that's so terrific that there's a film of this discussion about should he give the speech that night. Um, the, 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 I think there's a movie called Crisis, and it's sort of a cinema verite where a cameraman follows George Wallace all that day and Robert Kennedy, and I think maybe they were the ones who filmed that episode in, in when they were talking about whether to give the speech. But I'm going to run and and I go and see it. To see that because I can yeah. See No, very important. It's wonderful that, that it's here and that and that can that be uh, obtained online as well? Okay, that'd be great. I mean, for teaching, it'll be terrific for teaching. Yeah. Yes. Okay. That's a great question. Uh, if the people that Robert Kennedy met with, James Baldwin, Harry Belafonte, um, Lena Horne, number about 10 people in the end of May uh, of 1963, um, he and Belafonte continued. I mean, he felt that Belafonte didn't step up you know, during that discussion, and he thought that Belafonte knew him. But, so that it was just so divisive. Um, but I, I don't have any evidence that he and Baldwin, they weren't, you know, they'd met and, and all. And, and again, this period, it's so intense. Uh, I think Kenneth Clark, Kenneth Clark grew to really respect Robert Kennedy, and he thought he got it about education and about children. Um, so, but, but I should trace that out. I'm, I, I don't know for sure. You know. Yes. What are the lessons uh, for people working today around issues of police um, brutality and violence uh, that we're seeing? What can they learn from Robert Kennedy? I think, first of all, what people are doing facing the issue, right? I mean, just facing the issue and, and, and trying to understand it. You know, going, talking to people, and trying to build uh, a collective response. You know, I mean, to deal with the abuses and the violations of law, but then how do we organize ourselves uh, locally, starting locally, and um, as a country? To because these are the issues that were left in, in the late 60s. I mean, they're, they're, it's really eerie to think about how similar they are. Um, but I think that's, and to understand, too, the long haul. I'm going to tell my students. It's the long haul. It, it's really what history, te we've, been, we've lived with a lot of this, but we have had tremendous change. And to Robert Kennedy, how he lived his life and faced the issues and worked actively to do his part and work with people to begin to um, make some changes, not just around criminal justice issues, but education. All these things are connected that he was concerned about uh, in this part of his life. So to work on the various community issues um, that also are such a problem. Do you have a thought about that, though, yourself? You said, that's, thank you for that. And the lack of knowledge, lack of experience, lack of caring, too. 
that litany he read or t said at his, and he said that in a number of places about the difference between the gap between what uh, African Americans and whites, you know, in, in all areas of life, that continues. The measure of, um, you know, of the, of the difference in economic opportunity, educational access, income, you know, dealings with the police. So, you know, we need to look at our history and understand who we are. You know, and that's what he said, he said uh, when he spoke after King's, who are we as a country? And people really need to look at our history to understand that. Uh, and where do we want to go? You know, and I think um, you know, looking at this in this larger context can add to that um, in this moment. I think that's true too. <laughs> Take more walks, yes. <laughs> Together, Marilyn. I just, um, well, first, thank you so much. I think this was a wonderful presentation. Um, That's and, uh, no. That's, right. and that really is, was at the center of their, their concern. And Peter Edelman, that's put you on the spot, but I've read this several places that, um, I mean, thinking about, yeah, I've been real interested in how King and Kennedy are kind of moving in very similar directions. They, they didn't see a lot of each other and all, but they're really, um, and the Poor People's Campaign that, that um, you had you and Marion had been at visiting with Robert and Ethel Kennedy, and he suggested to Marion that she tell King to bring the poor people to Washington yeah. and stay there yeah. until and Marion goes to the SCLC convention that summer, and the poor people's campaign is launched. So maybe Dr. King was thinking about that, but the important thing is they're thinking along the same ways that and that thing about yourself, people have got to make demands. Right? I mean, um, who represents poor people? Poor people, right? But it, it's a huge, huge, would you like to speak to that point that Marilyn made about what to do? I mean, you teach a poverty yeah. seminar about the current economic crisis and how that affects. Well, I think it's well said. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, some of the things that we're dealing with, especially what's going on in Baltimore now, is so much uh, repeating history. Mm -hmm. Important. Uh, and going back to the bad side of it, the, the ways in which uh, the inequality is just exacerbated so many other other problems. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. And I do think that there's a just what you said that there's a sort of a disconnect of, of uh, at, at, at least um, we'll see what comes out of, of the, these current and recent events, but. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm, right, no, race and gender, yes, great. Do you have a coalition book yet on the legacy? Is there a legacy? Uh, do you have a message that you, uh, toward the end of your book yet uh, as to a conclusion of 
I think, what's the legacy of Robert Kennedy? I think it's that what he, the work he was doing right then, at the end of his life, is left for us to do now. You know, I mean, that he was doing it. And, uh, and you know, that experiencing nature, I love that notion. He lived in his world. And, you know, he said at one point, you don't, you didn't make the world, you inherited it. You inherit, but you live in it. And you need to do what you can while you're here. You know, so you didn't create the problems, fine, but you're living here now. And, um, and I think that approach and that sort of civic sense of responsibility and a real a faith in democracy, not in a naive way, but in that what it takes to, to address these issues and to be part of trying to move things forward. Um, it's, a, it's a living legacy because he kept growing. He just kept throughout his life. And, and during this extraordinary decade when public service and people really felt they could change, things, many people, and, and dedicated um, themselves to trying to do that. But that's always available, and it's really the only way. Yeah. I think one of his favorite quotes, every man can make a difference, and each man should try. That's good. Every man can make a difference, and each man should try. Yeah. Should we take one more? And then we'll At his death, were there any, uh, this is a question for, for Peter Edelman, but I think it's evident in, in what he was saying and, and doing and like the Bed Bedford-Stuyvesant project, other things. You know, the question is what, any indication of what his policies would have been uh, going forward, what his plans were. Um, oh, I think number one, end the war in Vietnam. Yes, end the war. Jobs, okay. And, and, and uh, of course, that very much you were talking, asking and talking about Dr. King, that was a, mm -hmm. he had gone in that direction mm -hmm. as well. And, and specifically, uh, the whole uh, question, uh, I heard somebody say this morning at where I was that, that uh, you can tell uh, a person's uh, life expectancy by their zip, zip code. That he certainly, when he talked about Bedford Stuyvesant, uh, he was again. There would have been many other ideas, but very much mm -hmm. uh, in the forefront uh, for him was the question of what are we going to do in these neighborhoods and the rural as well, oh, yeah. uh, where there's so many uh, people who are in poverty who are all packed together. Mm -hmm. And I think that was uh, on the on the domestic side and the, mm -hmm. the question. Mm -hmm. uh, particularly uh, came to a focal point on the question of concentrated poverty. Concentrated. Thank, thank you. Thank you. That's a great explanation. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.